I'll make that motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And present are? Susan Elwell. John Milcher. Charlie Costello. And Frank. Oh, Frank. Did you want to speak up? Yeah. yeah. All right, so first up is uh, Mary Duggan, the Executive Director of the Northeast Mosquito Control, to talk about our 2016 program. And also with her is, I forget your... Bill. Bill Mahaffey. Bill Mahaffey. So what I brought is uh, extra copies of the, um, the best management plan for Raleigh. You, you all have this in an email version, but I thought it would be nice to have it in front of you. And we'll explain what it is and what we hope to do this year, from here, and then next year to make things a little bit better. So this is the... So this is uh, the program, this, we sent this to you earlier in the year. I also brought, because I know you guys are in the Greenhead program, I brought you a 116th scale model of what your Greenhead traps look like, because people kind of like that. Um, I also brought along um, a sample of a rearing chamber so I can talk about the life cycles of mosquitoes if you get into that much. And because we operate in your town, at all levels, if there was water in here, there'd be the. Uh, we didn't find any mosquitoes mm -hmm. today, by the way, mm -hmm. so I couldn't bring you a sample. I could uh, have. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, so there, there's a there's a water treatments that we're doing now, and then there's the adult treatments that we do later in the season. So I just brought you that in a rearing <coughs> chamber to show you how we actually. If we don't know what mosquitoes we have, we'll rear them to adults, and they're easier to identify that way. So with that, I just it, with that overview, kind of, I'll talk about your best management plans. I brought some props along. Um, and I brought some pictures of things that are in the news today, including um, the Zika mosquito and then the cousin of the Zika mosquito um, that we're worried about and we're starting to pay some attention to here in Massachusetts. Is there anything else that you guys have on your agenda that you wanted me to cover or you wanted Bill to cover? Uh, catch basins, uh, treatments? Well, I can give you an update on and all that kind of stuff. So, so we finished our spring brood larva siding um, in all the towns in our district, including Rowley. Um, believe it or not, this spring has been really dry. I know it's, yeah. um, you probably know, <laughs> driving around now, it's um, a lot of woodland pools are, you know, pretty, pretty low or dry. We didn't find a whole lot. Um, we kind of moved into um, catch so that's, a, so that's a good thing. That's, that's a good thing. thing. Yeah. Spring brood is, it is what it is, mainly snow melt mosquitoes. They, you know, you get that flood of melt which we didn't have a lot of again mm -hmm. um, you know and then you get mosquitoes that hatch from those woodland pools we will get throughout the season you get rains and you get um, reflood mosquitoes they call them vex ends and they're not real um, uh, well, I want to say contributors bridge. to a uh, bridge vectors contributors to you know um, carrying virus but you know they're a nuisance more than anything so we'll keep an eye on those um, we moved into treating catch basins in all the communities. We try to work with the local DPWs to find out when they're going to clean basins. We don't want to put a product in and have them mm -hmm. clean it out tomorrow, then it does you no good. So I worked with Patrick Snow. He said that Rowley isn't going to clean the basins until this fall. So it's perfect. We get in and we use the long-term product, a BT product, um, which has a 90-day minimum residual so that'll take you well into August and, and just for the audience of BT <clears throat> is that bacillus uh, that's that's, that's yeah. very uh, uh, benign exactly to the environment to yeah. other animals it doesn't affect birds or you know invertebrates um, you know mammals I should say um, and it's a lava sign <laughs> yep specifically for black flies and mosquito larvae um, that's what it targets BT products have been approved by Organic Farms for use on farms. We use it on my farm. Um, that being said, um, all the basins in Raleigh have been treated as of the 16th. So we are done with that for the season. The, the reason why we try to treat early with a long-term product is you get a spike in mosquitoes. They'll start to hatch now. They usually come end of June, July into early August is when you get that virus. West Nile, we're trying to knock that down before we get to that point. So that's the reason of treating them now. Um, we've done one aerial salt marsh lava siding, again with BTI, liquid form, from the helicopter. That's all we use in the helicopter. Um, 
Raleigh, we treated 400 acres of salt marsh. Mainly it's along the upland edge, you know, from uh, the pages, the Newbury line, all the way to uh, Savages. So um, <clears throat> we did that last hmm, 19th, no. Yeah, I think yeah. it was the 19th. Yeah, it was. I lose track of time here. But, but um, yeah, so that, that's been done. We, we'll monitor the flood tides once a month um, or any rain event, because sometimes you get a heavy rain and it'll set off another brood between the tides. Um, the thing with salt marsh mosquitoes, they lay their eggs in the mud, not in water. So the marsh has to completely dry back along that upland edge for them to lay their eggs in. And if that doesn't happen, you know, some months we may not have to do a spray because we don't have the lava or the numbers there to warrant it. So um, that's kind of the update as of today. So, sorry, any questions? Or? So you, as part of the plan, when mosquitoes get started, we have traps in town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many traps do we have? Oh, they, you move them around as... Uh, well, we have historical trapping, you know, spots and stations. Um, we have a, a light trap. We've switched, we've gone to a different type of trap, the CEC <coughs> trap, which is, um, it's replacing the New Jersey light trap, which looks like a big bottle rocket, you know, mm -hmm. with a, like a, we used to call it the Tin Man. But, um, that used to have a light bulb inside, and the problem with that is you'd attract other insects, moths, and you know, um, non-target species. We try to get away from that. You get a cleaner collection with, um, you know, just using CO2. So we use um, bottled CO2, and it's on a timer, and so when that clicks on, the CO2 through a solenoid starts to be deployed, and the mosquitoes will go to that. And We've, we've switched traps to a different one that actually collects more species. Um, our new entomologist has used this for years and she's uh, pretty up on this type of trap and she wants to go that route. And we, we were the only ones in the whole state using the old New Jersey light traps. So I, you know, it's a, it's a real improvement for us. Then we have at the same location, we have a gravid trap, which is um, a pan of water and it's for the mosquitoes that come and lay their eggs in water in egg rafts and that's on at the same time or so both traps come on at the same time when a mosquito flies in to lay its eggs on the water it gets sucked up into with a fan up into a bag and we collect that along you know hmm. along with the same collection from the other trap and they're separated you know they're separated to begin with but we keep them so we know which ones are gravid mosquitoes which tend to be the um, West Nile carrying mosquitoes and then the light traps you could get you could get some West Nile mosquitoes in that or, you, or you also um, maybe some Tripoli mosquitoes but it's more of a general um, cross of the population and what's in the community the light trap is mm -hmm. And then a third trap, which we don't have in Raleigh because we don't have a lot of um, the mosquitoes here, the Culicida melanora, which is the triple E mosquito, which tends to breed in um, cedar swamps, um, red maple swamps, and it breeds in crypts, which are really hard to control and get at the, the roots of the tree, mm. hollows down there. Um, I think triple E has been low the last couple years here because of... Um, you know, the small amount of water that we have right now. Last year we had, well, you know, we had all that snow. We had feet of snow in 2014 and 15, but it was light snow. There wasn't a lot of moisture in it. So when it melted, there wasn't a lot of water. <clears throat> we, this is the second year in a row that we found woodland pools in the spring pretty low or dried up. So um, I think we're going to be hurting with the water down the road this summer, but um, that's my opinion. But um, so those traps we have more or less along the New Hampshire border. New Hampshire gets more triply than we do, the Newton, New Hampshire area, uh, Kingston, Southampton. <clears throat> so we kind of target that. I don't want to say put up a barrier, but we want to know what's happening on that border. And we have had them as far in as on um, like Topsfield because they have, you know, some big swamps in Boxford. 
um, we still trap for those mosquitoes in Boxford because they have the habitat for it. We don't tend to have that habitat in Rowley. So um, we, we try to look at the whole community and historic, you know, for years of trapping, we know what's here for mosquitoes and that's what we target. So, so just, uh, just a, a, a brief description. So you, you pick up these, these traps on, on a regular basis. Twice a week. And during the season, mm -hmm. and who does the testing of the mosquitoes? Okay, so the mosquitoes are collected twice a week, brought back to our lab in Georgetown. They're ID'd by our um, entomologist or her partner, and bridge vectors are, are mosquitoes that can be, um, you know, vec actually vectors of the virus. Um, <laughs> You know, whether it be West Nile or Triple E or down the road, um, the 80s Egypti, you know, for dengue and all that. We're looking at all that. Um, those get put into pools. And when they say a pool, people think, oh, there was a mosquito found on Hammond Street in a swimming pool. No. A pool is a collection um, of up to 50 mosquitoes. Those um, Mosquitoes that we kind of tag as you know suspicious get sent into the Department of Public Health in Jamaica Plain. They're tested for those two viruses. Um, I think at some point they may expand to yes. look at other testing. And what, like some other people, viruses, what some people but, don't know is that in order for a mosquito to carry a virus, it's not that it has, it's a bloody mosquito. The blood has the virus. The virus moves into the mosquito's body. So we don't need bloody mosquitoes to find the virus. We just need the mosquito, and we crush up the mosquitoes. You can usually find it in just the legs or the heads. So we, they crush up the mosquitoes in the Department of Public Health, and they use an antibody uh, test, a lot like you'd have antibody tests for anything that you're going. And then they, they test it uh, in the lab in Boston with PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which is the same kind of stuff that amplifies D, uh, DNA during crime scenes, investigative crime scenes, right? So we take these tiny mosquitoes, we, have, we take about 50 of them because they think that's enough material. They, they, not, they rack them up and they put them through this PCR machine, which amplifies them so they can test for these viruses. So when we collect them, we don't have to have a bloodied mosquito. And if you ever get slap a bloodied mosquito, that doesn't mean it's going to give you the virus. The virus actually comes through the saliva, so you don't have to see a bloodied mosquito. So that's why we do, we know what, what mosquitoes are able to carry the virus, and the, that means the virus is able to overcome their own immune systems. So a mosquito has an immune system in its gut, in its blood, and in its saliva glands. So only certain mosquitoes lack the ability to beat off the virus, which is why we mm -hmm. say a bridge vector is a bridge vector. Very specific species can carry these viruses from one to the other. So the West Nile mosquito is different than the Triple E mosquito because those viruses are smart enough to take advantage of different mosquitoes, which is why we become so helpful because as a proxy of the virus, we see the mosquito, we identify it, we only send the samples to the Department of Public Health that we know are candidates, saves us money because they charge us back per pool. This isn't a free service from the Commonwealth. So we send them specific mosquitoes under specific conditions. And, um, and the Department of Public Health is starting to ask us to send more. We're being a little cautious because I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm frugal, but I want to make sure that that we're not testing mosquitoes that we know aren't carrying the virus. So to mm -hmm. his to uh, to Bill's point, the whole idea of when people talk about bridge vectors or how do you know it's a triple E mosquito? What do you mean a West Nile mosquito? They are they are uh, historically very well documented to what can carry what. And if you have Zika questions, and the reason I prefaced it this way is that's how, that's how I've been answering any questions about the Zika virus, because it also is a very specific mosquito that we can keep an eye out for. <coughs> the pool that you submit, is it all the same species? No. Yes. Oh, well, good. yes. Um, a pool will be one species. I was thinking more broad, but yeah. you, could, you know, we might send in 37 pools in mm -hmm. any given day, um, and it could be, you know, seven different species. It could be three, three pools of one species, you know. So, okay. So they literally, uh, the, we've got some really nice microscopes, and they literally, these guys are really good. They sort them really quickly into species, and then they clump them into these 50 mosquito categories. Um, this year, as a pilot, we're starting to collect enough. We're going to start trying to do a, a non-official preliminary test. 
so we can give the boards of health a heads up that we think we might get a positive. Because as you guys know, we don't get notification from them until Friday mm -hmm. morning. And the boards of health in Topsfield, I've read loud and clear, uh, if there's any way you can do this a little earlier, you know, we'd like to do that. Well, I can't change the DPH schedule yet. I'll work on it. But what I can do is give you a little bit of a heads up on Wednesday or Thursday that we think we have a positive coming. And that is very unofficial, but it's with using a, a, a antibody test that we have some confidence in that we, the test is probably great, but we have confidence that we can operate the test well. Um, so we'll be working on that this year. We'll be finding some correlations, but we're hoping that that will help us make the investments for our district so you guys get, on f before the official news comes in Thursday night or Friday morning, you know to keep somebody around to checking email. So we're, with, we're working on that a little bit. That would be for West Nile, uh, primarily Tripoli a little bit, and those are the two test rent tests that we have right now. As far as your public relations, outreach for these suspected outbreaks. Do you independently contact the local media with these alerts or you mm -hmm. leave it up for the local boards to do? We leave, I'm gonna, we, mm -hmm. we leave it to the Department of Public Health and to the local boards because we're mosquito people, we're not epidemiologists and we're not your public health. So this early alarm is basically is just for us Yep. to be mm -hmm. so that Frank can spend the weekend in the office. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> a okay. lot, I will say a lot of times, and this happens more often than not, we get the call from the media and they say, you've got a triple E hit in Ipswich. We don't even know it yet. Right. We're usually the last ones to know. So what Mary's talking about, the ramp test, yep. I mean, it, it can give us a heads up before the sample's going to Boston. We can take a few out of that sample. Yep and say, oh, it looks like we might have a problem here, and give you a heads up. We might want to set some other traps out mm -hmm. to see if it's just localized or widespread. Yep. So that's kind of the route we go. And then if, I usually get the phone call from the newspaper if, if, mm -hmm. somebody, if we have a little early warning, then Frank and I can put together a, a proper mm -hmm. uh, factual mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. that's a good. You have this new system. We and, we will try. Yeah. The Department of Public Health, as they should, wants to own all of those official communications, and they should. We are mosquito people, right? right. But we because there are because mosquitoes and viruses are well documented. These antibody tests that come out of Canada actually um, are re somewhat reliable. So this year we're piloting it. We'll see how it works. If we get a correlation, uh, maybe I'll I'll. I'll woo the people at DPH to say that we can officially call you, but right now we're unofficially using it as a pilot to see how it works. But primarily because people, like Frank at the Topsfield meeting said, you know, we know that we're, you, we know that, you know, we're, we work 24 seven, but really Friday afternoon is a really bad time for us. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, we're, we heard that yeah. and we're gonna try to, we're gonna try to alleviate that a little bit. Now, now about the Zika virus, mm -hmm. is, I, I, what are you changing or what, what different procedures, uh, are, are, do you have more, any different tests or anything, or is it basically... So why don't I talk about the mosquito mm -hmm. and you talk about the trap? Mm -hmm. Okay, the new trap. So the, the Zika mosquito is the same mosquito we had in colonial times called the yellow fever mosquito. So it's, it's a seasonal mosquito up here at best. Um, it's, it's Aedes aegypti. So the, if it was still just that mosquito, we wouldn't be as worried because they have to come imported and they tend to import in to the southern region and since we test our boats coming into the port, we don't get the yellow fever mosquito coming in the ports. Um, so we have had not had a lot of trouble with Aedes aegypti, which is the mosquito that's in Brazil, it's the mosquito that's in Puerto Rico, it's the mosquito that's in Florida causing all the hoopla. The problem, well, and that mosquito carries yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, and now Zika. Um, it has a cousin called uh, Aedes albopictus. You've probably seen the news <coughs> called the Asian tiger mosquito. Mm. The Asian tiger is an invasive mosquito. It's invasive to the U.S. It actually went back and invaded Africa, which is where Aedes aegypti comes from. So it's actually it's invading all over the world. And this mosquito is much more flexible. It's also been indicated in it when it it's been indicated to be able to carry the same viruses as. Uh, the Egypti. 
So the Egypti is a very delicate mosquito. It's it's aggressive biter, but it likes to live near your house. It likes very warm. <coughs> it only bites humans. It likes to live near your house. It's an urbanized mosquito. Some people actually say um, when it was imported into the New World, it came in on ships. So it really adapted to human behavior. It's anthropomorphic. It lives in urban areas. That's Aedes aegypti. The Asian tiger mosquito, that's what we're worried about, is invasive. So we are paying attention to what's happening in the South. But we don't want anybody importing that mosquito because based on yellow fever in colonial times, we know it can come in and survive for a summer. But we're primarily looking at its cousin. And its cousin is a little more flexible where it lays its eggs, but we're taking advantage of that with some new traps. So Yeah, we've, I forget how many we have, maybe 15 or so. Um, these mosquitoes like... Um, specifically like tires, tire piles. Mm -hmm. um, there's a huge one in Middleton. I think you can see it from space. Um, Esteban always said there were two things you could pick out from space, the tire pile in Middleton and the Great Wall of China. Um, it's huge. So Kim, our entomologist, she is um, going to set some of these traps around that area and a few others here and there. Um, I think Merrimack has a pretty good tire pile on Bear Hill Road, certain places. Um, the trap has, I believe, I'm not real familiar with it, but it has sticky paper, is that correct? So when the mosquito that's attracted to this trap um, goes in to lay its eggs, it gets caught on the paper. So we can collect eggs and the mosquitoes all in one. So we don't really expect to find the mosquito, but we're putting these out just in case. Um, in every so community or? No, no, we don't have enough traps to do that, just in places. What I suspect, like Middleton area. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> there's a tire recycling plant in Air Mass. We actually, that's where our tires go. Uh, they grind the tires up as soon as we drop them off and they go in to make asphalt and different things of that nature. Um, they have found mosquitoes there, I believe, um, in one of these traps. Um, this a couple of years ago, maybe last year. But it's not, it doesn't have everybody, everybody's radar up yet, but. Um, you know, they think it was just a fluke. It might have come in on a tire or in, in tires. The, the mosquito will lay eggs in tires, and then, um, you know, people go and collect them. New Bedford is a place where they get a lot of tires. Um, and the um, Bristol County Mosquito Control has found, <coughs> excuse me, um, eggs down there. So that's about, it's about as close as, you know, to us as they found them. Um, but we just want to be alert to the fact that, you know, we could possibly see them and we want to be able to have these traps, you know, in order to trap some of them if they're in the area. So. And the Department of Public Health is starting a, a, tra a trapping program across the Commonwealth to try to look for eggs and they will hatch them uh, in, a, in a liquid and grow them up to make sure that mm -hmm. they're actually the mosquito. It's a, it's a striking looking mosquito. These are a black and white mosquito. This is actually the one we're talking about. Um, so that's, that's the tiger. The that's Asian the Asian tiger Asian mosquito. Tiger. You'll see it in the in the news or in your public. You'll see it called a you know, ATM. ATM. You'll see it called an ATM. Um, it's it, around my area where my lab they'll call it albopictus, but and uh, I often call it Asian tiger because <laughs> I, I prefer that. This is the uh, this is the cousin. This is the Aedes aegypti. They're both black and white mosquitoes. They have striped legs. Um, they're they're, they look unusual to, to you. I mean, if, you, if we had to make people aware of what they look like, it's the black mosquito, not the brown mosquito. It's, it, 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 we hope not to have to do that in our lifetimes, because we don't think it'll move that far up. But uh, this mosquito, the one that's really invasive, uh, that actually came into the U.S. in tires from Asia. Um, and it's, it, we think the population in New Bedford is year-round. So the Department of Public Health is spending a lot of time in Bristol County, in New Bedford, and we're spending a lot of time looking at tires that get imported. Our hope uh, is that this mosquito, which is very adaptable, does not adapt to cold weather. But when you start to see the CDC maps that are coming out of Zika and they start shading up, up our area, there is some indication that the invasive mosquito, the cousin of the one we really worry about, but still 
that it, there's some indication that it will start to adapt to cold weather. It's, mm -hmm. it's just the nature of an invasive species. Um, the other species, the Egypti, is thought to have come over on all the trade ships from the new old world to the new world. It really was happiest in urban environments. And this is the mosquito that they say they wiped out in the 70s with the DDT Pan American program, which is why we eliminated dengue in the Americas in the 60s and 70s. This is the mosquito they eliminated. And when they stopped the program, this mosquito came back. This is the Egypti. This is this is a cousin. And this is a complete. This is an invasive species. So that's what we're worried about. This is what you're reading about in the news. Um, they're both fascinating mosquitoes, but I have to sort of be a crazy mosquito person like me to think that. But um, but yeah, we're 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 on top of the monitoring of it. And, uh, I was telling Bill, I actually personally got a call from a friend on Sunday morning about Zika, and so I know it's on people's minds. So we're we're trying to let people know that if we even see the mosquito. Um, the Department of Public Health, I'm sure, will notify us, but we mm -hmm. haven't seen the mosquito yet. Hence our ramp up of all the tire, um, uh, tire program. Yeah. You know, we did a big clean up in Groveland. We removed over 600 tires from some, that was fish and wildlife property, yeah. you know, in the woods. And then we just did the um, hazardous waste day in Andover a couple weeks ago. <coughs> and, um, so that was a good, good thing. And we've been working with mosquito control oh, yeah. in our right. last year. We have the yeah. 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 yeah, that's yeah. right. In the fall. Yeah. 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 Last two or three years now. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Do we have any more, any mosquito questions from the board? No. Marvelous information. We Frank, do you fun. have any? Uh, <coughs> no, I think we. I have one green ed question. Mm -hmm. Could you quickly, because we're, we're running long on your time, uh, just give us what the life cycle of of the greenheads are, say, in the Raleigh River area, or the Raleigh area, what, you know, tide-wise, you know, how does, is there, is there a correlation? I'll do the 30 seconds, yeah, and then you do okay. the folklore. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, the greenhead is a tabanid, it's a deer fly, it's a, house, it's a horse fly family. The first hatching, the first time they need to lay eggs, they don't bite people. So the first, you always have a greenhead, whether it bit you or not, there'll be a greenhead cycle. The second uh, brood needs the female to bite you. So like, unlike other horse flies that male and females bite you, in the greenhead world, only the female bites you. And she bites you for that second brood. The only upside so far I've been able to find for greenheads is that it's a proxy species for the health of your marsh and your rivers. Okay. The fact that you have them means that you have a good ecosystem because the larvae in the mud are high-end predators. So they don't survive if there's not a lot of life for them to eat. So that's my uh, ecological mm -hmm. sciences point of view of why I think greenheads are fascinating, but I avoid them when it's play. So, so as far as trapping, um, from Ipswich to the New Hampshire border, we put out 400 traps, roughly. Half of those are in Ipswich. They pay for 200 traps. We bait every trap with an octanol strip, which is some mosquito magnets use octanol as a bait. Um, the greenheads love it. Um, it kind of simulates uh, cattle grazing on the marsh, you know, that smell. Uh, with that said, we, the first hatch, and anybody that lives here knows come 4th of July, it's there right, <laughs> right around the corner, right? <laughs> um, even before, it's even late June. Yeah, it could, yep, can be. It yeah. yeah. So by 4th of July, you're into it. Yeah, so, um, that's for sure. <laughs> we, we try to get our traps out well before the 4th, usually by the end of June. So in the next few weeks, we'll be in the marshes putting those out. Um, the old timers, my father for one used to say, if you get a severe thunderstorm right when they hatch, it would knock them down. I believe that. I've seen that happen before. Um, there's usually two hatchings, one like, you know, end of June, mm -hmm. um, and another one in August. The second one doesn't seem to be as bad, and they don't last as long. So, and it's weird because some people say, oh, it must have done a great job. Um, there's hardly any greenheads this year. It's all weather dependent. Um, the traps are there no matter what, same amount, um, you know, and, and we'll find some years they're half full of flies and other years there's very little. So um, it's definitely weather dependent. They love the heat, those hot, steamy days, you know. So there's, there's no correlation to the, the lunar tide cycle? Well, 
I, th I don't know. Um, I think they're ready to emerge um, out of the mud. Out of the mud at sometime in June. I mean, that's kind of a given. It's like you know, one to bird's nest. One, to, you know, it's all kind of to do with that. Um, a flood tide too. A, a spring tide over the marsh um, could do a job on them. Could do a job on them. Correct. Right. Um, so there's a lot of factors. I know I wouldn't want to be one. I think there's too much going against it, but yet they survive. You know, insects are survivors. Um, but they're so, not really bright, which is why we no. can catch them in these fairly straightforward traps where we set these up and these get a lot of heat. Now, we're black and the cape is blue. It's exactly the same other than the color. The heat starts to come. The four legs are believed to indicate the four legs of an animal that they're going after. They come up into the belly, they come up and look for the light, they get trapped up here. The thin coating is to keep the flies in and the big coating is to keep the seagulls out because mm. we don't want them breaking through. And, that, and then that all gets secured so that the people don't pry it off or it doesn't fall off in a storm. And they, get, they get secured down and they go out every, uh, every summer and they come back every fall. We take them down, we break them down, we clean them up, and we do all the stuff we need to do. If we find praying mantis cases, we collect them and try to hatch them off, um, which we were worked successful mm -hmm. with one egg, praying mantis egg case this year. Um, and, then, um, and then we turn around and we put them back out again. So this is the program. Um, we have round ones and square ones. The square ones are made of plywood and the round ones are made of uh, plastic. Um, we're trying to figure out, we don't think there's a difference in... in Doesn't you know, seem to be. The plastic ones, one of, the, one of our employees said, hey, um, the BTI drums, the 30 gallon drums for the air spray, the liquid. He said, you know, we're rinsing these and disposing of them. Why can't we do something, you know, to use them? So he designed a greenhead trap out of a barrel. And the, the inside, you know, he kind of made a cone instead of the, like a lobster trap. But those collect flies. I think anything you, you, you know, I tell people, park your car and leave the windows down. They'll fill up, you know, it's like anything. Well, Right. will catch flies. So the, the barrel trap, as we call it, I think is just as good as th these that you see and have seen mm -hmm. forever. This was designed, I guess, um, 68. Yeah, there was a lot of studies done in Maine, you know, on the color and, and all that, so, but that's kind of the standard. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank okay. you very much. All right. We nope. hope we hope for a good year. No yep. telephone calls back and forth. We hope for that too. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep you in up to date with anything you know that takes place as far as air sprays or things like yes. that. So exactly, yeah. and definitely virus if and when. Yeah. Knock on wood. Right. We hope not to get it. Yeah. Any questions on the new facility? Uh, and if you wanted to. No. No. Oh, I thought you were that. Okay. No, I. You're happy in new at your new place in Georgetown. Yes, it's more centrally located for us from Plum Island, um, right off of 95. We have everything under one roof. Um, yeah, it's a good location. Landlord's next door. Oh. <laughs> he does environmental work, so he usually understands why mm -hmm. we have stuff in the backyard that, that don't, other people might not <clears throat> understand. So what it's part of good. Georgetown are you in? Tenney Street. Oh. You know where T Ford is? Yeah. We rent from him. Oh, nice. Yep. Right Stilling mm -hmm. electric is on the corner. We're just beyond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how big is your staff? We have ten full time. We have yeah, we eleven with the with Maureen's. We have uh, during the regular season we have uh, eleven people who get benefits. One's a part time with benefits, and then during the summer we pick up five or six more depending on what it is. Seasonal. Seasonal. Yeah. And we've got 32 communities, plus Essex came back in for Greenhead Trap, so we're busy. We have three people start today, so we're pretty excited. We have a Whittier uh, High School graduate who's at UMass Law in Environmental Studies, so we're very excited about that. And we've got a Middleton resident who went back to school sort of mid-career, and she's at Salem State getting her degree. So, And then we have a bunch of retirees who know the area really well, and uh, they've been with us sometimes nine and ten years. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good group of um, really dedicated, <coughs> service-oriented people. And it's, it, that's a special thing to be service-oriented, as you guys well know, or we wouldn't be here. Um, so they're really, they're really conscientious and uh, 
very giving of their time, their energy, and great to the community. They'll stop, they'll explain to anyone at any time what they're doing. They're just really good mm -hmm. ambassadors and stewards of the land and the, and the communities. I'm very, I've been here about eight months and I'm very, couldn't be more pleased with, with the, the whole relationship and the whole way this whole group works together. It's awesome. <coughs> and where did Esteban go? Did he Florida. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Now when they Zico really have problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's some issues with his mom and his, the house he owns down there, and so he had to deal with you know a lot of things there. I think he was looking at Florida mosquito control. I mean, they're huge. But, um, I can only imagine. I mean, he, I think he could get a job anywhere with you know somebody like that. Sure. Hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. next up, we have Alicia Frazier to talk about her internship with us. Hello. Um, first, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to do this. Um, as you know, I spent the past four, about four months here um, since the beginning of February. Yeah. Um, I kind of, it, it was a project for my master's in public health. Um, we had to do field experience. Um, it was 120 hours of field experience required for the program. Um, so I came on kind of unsure of exactly what I was going to be doing with the Board of Health. Um, Frank and Wendy kind of gave me some guidelines. My major projects were to come up with sort of a database of private wells in the town. Um, and to also um, look into the possibility of getting a GPS and some GIS software for the board um, to kind of help track septic systems and wells and have more of a visual representation of where everything is within the town. Um, and this is your report? Yes. Yes, the, 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 the yeah. um, So I kind of came in, I started, the, the main project I think was supposed to be the well mapping um, we kind of hit some roadblocks with the water department getting lists of, um, you know, who has service and who doesn't, and I wasn't able to get as in-depth in that. We were going to look at the cross -connect potential cross-connections um, within the town, um, but we were able to get kind of a, like, paper map of well locations and really go through the, the computer database and make sure it was up to date and everything was sort of in one centralized document. Um, I took on some kind of other day-to-day -day tasks. Um, I didn't quite realize the extent of what you guys do in the office every day. Um, I went on a couple of field visits um, for some food inspections. Um, I had the opportunity to go for a, a perk test, but I wasn't able to make it to that. Um, some kind of day-to-day -day office stuff, some filing and organizing and kind of getting to the stuff that nobody really has the time to get to. So it's able to kind of tie up some loose ends. And, <laughs> um, and working with our health nurse also. Yes. Uh, I think you said a couple days. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, and she yeah. went through um, the MAVEN program with me and kind of discussed what happens if there is any kind of <coughs> communicable disease in the community or, um, you know, um, foodborne illness, outbreaks, things like that, um, kind of procedures in place. And it was definitely an, a good learning opportunity. Um, the program that I did was more focused on kind of broader public health, like more at the, like the state or federal level. So it was definitely interesting to work in like a local small town um, and see what it is, you know, what, what's done on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think the program that I did was more focused on like, you know, crisis prevention and, and like kind of bigger, broader topics. Um, I mean, we touched upon community health and um, that kind of stuff, but it was, it was definitely really interesting to see it firsthand, especially growing up in Raleigh, um, kind of getting into small town politics and seeing how things work, and <laughs> it was good. Um, so the last few weeks I have been working on that budget proposal 
um, for the GPS unit and GIS software. Um, thank you. So I had been communicating with Gerard Witten, the um, GIS manager for the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. Um, I talked to him about kind of what the board is looking for, um, what their needs would be for GIS software. And he was able to come and meet with us to talk about the different options. He showed us um, an application, like a, a mobile application for an iPad. Um, they use a program called ArcGIS. And it's actually in use in a lot of surrounding communities. Um, he showed us the, a program that they made specifically for the town of Amesbury for their recycling program. Um, Using ArcGIS? Yes. Um, so they use this program. They design it specifically for the municipalities in the area. Um, so his group could create this application specifically for the Board of Health or any other department within the town. Um, with exactly what would be needed. So there's already um, the septic system database in place. He can take all of the information from that and put it within this app. He can add information about um, private wells, you know, the type of wells, any um, water quality testing that was done on the well, um, when it was built, who built it. Anything can be put into it. It can be specifically designed <coughs> with whatever that the board wants. Um, things can be added later, things can be taken out, it can be tweaked. It's, it's not um, you know, a program that's pre-designed. It's made specifically for the Raleigh Board of Health. So um, it's a pretty interesting program. Um, is that option three? And, and is that what you're talking about reflected in this budget? Yes. Yeah. So that was the most kind of comprehensive option. Um, the application kind of combines everything that could possibly be done. Um, the GPS unit was a big um, kind of factor in the conversation because what the board is looking for is to be able to map locations of both private wells and septic systems on everybody's properties. Um, Right now, the only kind of visual representation that's available of these systems are as-built plans, um, if they're available, and they've only been how um, long? Um, it's a few, quite a few years, okay. but um, going way back, there, mm -hmm. some of our files, we have nothing. So. Yeah. I mean, I went through a lot of files and came across a number of them, probably about a third of the files that I went through had no plans at all. So, you know, if, if that homeowner comes in looking for their septic system, we have no record of, of where it actually is located. Um, so this project would kind of be moving into the future. Obviously, if you don't know where the systems are, there's nothing, you know, there's, there's nowhere that you can look to find that information to put it into a program like this. But um, the idea of the GPS is to um, any new systems that are built or any systems that are repaired, um, a GPS could go out and tag the exact location so that an exact visual representation of where they are on the property um, in location to abutting properties, in location to wells, water supplies, um, anything like that. Um, so we talked about a number of different options in terms of GPS tracking. So I mean, you know, your cell phone or a tablet has a GPS inside of it, but they're not very accurate. Um, the accuracy levels on something like that it can be anywhere from five to eight meters. So, you know, 10 to 20 feet, that could be on somebody else's property. Um, so for the purposes of something like this, you want really precise measurements, precise locations. Um, and for that, you would need kind of a high-end GPS unit um, for professional grade GPS's, even the lower end models don't have the accuracy levels required to get such a precise location. Um, you know, those have accuracy levels of one to two meters, um, which is, you know, up to six or seven feet, which is still could be on another property or could be, you know, on the other side of, of you know, if you're looking for a distribution box that's, you know, not even seven feet wide. Um, obviously, you want that that accuracy to be a bit more. Um, what base map are you tying this to? 
The MyMap software that the Merrimack <coughs> Valley Planning Commission uses, um, the Board of Health uses that now. Um, so and all of this. What's the accuracy of that? It's reasonably accurate. It's based on um, assessors' maps, so it's it's reasonably accurate. But they have um, a couple of different overlays within the map. One of them is sort of just a. You can see it. This is what the mm -hmm. picture here is from my map. Um, it's just kind of blocks drawn onto there, but there's also like an aerial, like an actual aerial photography, um, and you can kind of see if you if you switch between the two layers, they'll shift a little bit, so it's not a hundred percent accurate. Um, but the GPS uses coordinate locations, so even if you know the the picture on my map isn't 100% accurate, the, the GPS locations within the map would be 100% accurate, or 99% accurate. Um, but if you, the point, with the expensive GPS, the point wouldn't jive with the map. If you looked at the aerial picture, right. it would be. Because the, the accuracy of the aerial map is three meters. Okay. So, but anyway, that's, I would think this would be, thank you for your work, and uh, I would very much support us considering moving mm -hmm. on uh, working with the regional planning group and uh, using some of our funds, which we have, to get the hard way to do it. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And, really and uh, you've, uh, you've pulled it together and helped us along. Nice job, Alicia. After we buy the hardware, you can come back. There are things to do. I don't know if you want to touch on what you know you've been doing the last couple of weeks about physically drawing them. On oh, the, yeah. To just kind of show how this would really help us. Um, if, if you want, you know, it can't be in too much detail. But. No. Um, so when we met with Gerard, he kind of went through from the cheapest to the most expensive, from the least comprehensive to the most comprehensive, all of the different options, um, because he knows, you know, being a small town, that budget isn't, you know, necessarily readily available for everything. So he came up with this option of using the markup feature in my map that we're already using. Um, I mean, the town already pays to use this software, so um, the markup function is free, essentially. Um, and that you can use the as-built plans that we already have to physically draw a representation of where the systems are, both wells and septic systems. Um, so that's kind of what I've been doing for the past month or so, is kind of diving into these files and getting them started. Um, because like I said, with the GPS, it's only really useful for new systems or systems that are being repaired that are above or you know not buried, because obviously you can't see a septic system once it's already filled in. Um, so this would be a good way to kind of capture pre-existing systems, anything that we have files for. Um, but this function was very tedious. It's not, not particularly user friendly. It took a long time to map each individual property. Um, you have to use the ties on the, the plans to kind of find the locations and it it's, takes a lot of trial and error. Um, I had um, one of the volunteers in the office sitting with me, um, showing her how to use the program, and you know she had a hard time kind of picking it up. It's one of those programs that you wouldn't necessarily be able to just kind of do here and there. Like you would have to really sit down and learn how to use it. Because I've been doing it now for like a month or so, it's a, a little easier for me. But even Wendy, who has a lot of experience with computers, sat down and did it and struggled with it at first, like it's, there's definitely a learning curve to it and it's definitely um, extremely time consuming and not overly accurate. Um, so we thought it would be a great option at first because it's cheap. The only fee associated with it was just a, you know, kind of a one-time fee to upload that data onto the MyMap. Um, but it was just not efficient at all. I mean, it, it like I said, it would be great to kind of slowly add more and more to the program from the old files, um, but as kind of a long-term solution, it, it's not very practical. Um, so the thing that Gerard was saying is if you were to adopt the 
GIS application, the mobile application, there's a similar markup feature within that application. Um, so instead of using the markup on my map, you would use a markup function within ArcGIS to do kind of the same thing. And where is the license for ArcGIS in this budget? Um, a standalone license is about twenty five hundred dollars. I, I don't I, I don't see that here. And I believe Nermac Valley would have the I don't know. Well, we can check yeah, that. Yeah, we'll have to check that out. Yeah. yeah, I mean the the amount that he gave was a hosting fee to design and maintain the application. Yeah, so, so I don't maybe know that's if there's an additional license or if that was yeah included. But in anyway, that. we could look we could look yeah. into that. But again, thank you very much. This is uh, very helpful, and we'll we'll move along with this. Yeah, we started because um, we've been doing a lot with wells lately. So originally, we had the whole list of wells, and Alicia was plugging the wells in, and then we started growing to the putting the wash doing the well to put the septic into. But like she was saying, it's very time consuming, and so this might be a better road to go. Mm -hmm. And there, there is haven't all the <coughs> Assessor maps been digitized by Merrimack yes. Valley. Yeah, that's what the my map. Is. So that's what the my map is is from. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I Thank hope you. it helped Good you luck. as much as you helped us. <laughs> no, definitely. I actually graduation was on Saturday. Saturday. So my degree now. Wow. Good. 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 Excellent. Have you got a job yet? I'm actually going off to medical school in the fall. Oh. So. Kind of taking a different route, going back into school. Yeah. Well, good luck. Where are you going? Um, UMass, Med, and Worcester. So. Good luck to you. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. See you. All right. Next up is Mary Ellen. Hello. I don't, and we're gonna. I think my agenda is kind of disappeared. It's a job description. Just to talk about yeah, the, the right here. Discuss the wellness clinic. Yeah. Well, actually, the whole job description has yeah. changed. There's a copy in your packet. Oh. Also. So the agenda wasn't right. Well, no, it is. Yeah. It's it just, is. Oh, this is yeah. a, a piece of it. <laughs> Jeez. Well, I don't know. I see. It should be a uh, wellness clinic is the subject, but uh. no, this is more supporting. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You must should, it's check. 